her. She's from Counseling and Degree Psychology Research Advisors, Ellen Cole and Patricia O'Connor. Hi, so I'm Nadia. Um, I'd like to start by asking you all a question. By a show of hands, how many of you have ever video chatted with your friends or family using FaceTime, Skype, or other video chat applications? Ooh, so quite a lot of you. <laughs> now, how many of your grandparents, or maybe even great-grandparents, use video chat to communicate with friends or family? So not as many the second time. So I found that when I ask these questions, more than likely, individuals from older generations don't use as much technology as we do. I'm always using video chat to communicate with friends and family, as do many others. We're becoming a technological society at an extremely fast pace, but unfortunately, some individuals from the older generation are not as up to speed as the changes as we are. And imagine, if these same individuals don't use video chat like we do, what are the odds that people with dementia do? So these questions led me to the purpose of my pilot study, which is to examine whether video chat between long-term care residents with dementia and their family caregivers after placement of their relatives in a long-term care setting improves quality of life. Dementia is one of the leading causes of disability and death among the elderly population. Dementia is characterized by progressive declines in memory, thinking, and behavior that affect an individual's ability to make decisions, manage affairs, and perform work-related tasks, resulting in total dependence on others. Relatives of diagnosed loved ones can experience significant distress being primary caretakers, managing challenging behaviors, and also experience distress after placement of their relatives in a long-term care setting. Most treatment options available to people with dementia are medically based and fail to provide for their psychosocial needs, such as having a sense of autonomy, dignity, and respect. Further, there are roughly 24 million people who live with dementia, and this number is expected to double every 20 years, reaching as high as 81 million by 2040. Now this is a huge concern, because as people live longer, the rate of dementia is expected to rise. And with no cure currently in sight, we need not only prevention efforts, but treatment options to promote quality of life. Dementia not only affects the diagnosed individuals, but also families and others who care for their needs. Dementia is one of the most disabling and burdensome health conditions worldwide, and its progressive nature continues to impact not only the one living with dementia, but their families as well. So with the dementia diagnosis, there's an increased prevalence to develop behavioral and psychological symptoms, and some of these include aggression, agitation, depression, hallucinations, and delusions. Not only does this cause additional stress to the one living with dementia, but again, those who care for them. A dementia diagnosis is associated with a lower quality of life, leading to negative affect, greater dependency, and other negative consequences. There's been an increased use of psychotropic medication and physical restraints to manage behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And these methods have been criticized due to their limited efficacy and adverse effects. And lastly, research has shown that caregiver burden continues after placement of their relatives in a long-term care setting, and there are limited resources to address <laughs> this. The utilization of video chat can help address these important concerns. Video chat can promote conversation, support the family caregiver, and prompt engagement even as the disease progresses. Video chat is feasible, non-invasive, inexpensive, and can support behavioral changes in people with dementia in long-term care settings. I used it within subjects pre-test, post-test design. I conducted one-to-one -one interviews with family caregivers and residents with dementia. I recruited three pairs, and the residents were recruited from two assisted living facilities in New York. 
The video chat intervention was three weeks long with a three week follow up to see if the results were consistent over time. Three untimed video chat sessions were scheduled per week, totaling to nine video chat sessions per pair. And I asked permission from the participants to observe the nature of each video chat session. So personal identifying information was changed to preserve the confidentiality of my participants. The first pair I worked with was Robert and Caitlin, which you know aren't their real names. Robert is 97 years old and diagnosed with moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. Robert was the oldest resident at one of the assisted living facilities, and you could almost always find him sitting in his favorite chair. Robert was hard of hearing, and his Alzheimer's disease affected his speech, so he was only able to verbalize short, concise words and sentences. Despite this, Robert was a renowned lip reader, and he was well aware of what people were communicating to him. Caitlin was Robert's family caregiver and the youngest of his children. She resided in Oregon, and due to the distance, couldn't visit Robert in person as often. Prior to this experience, Robert and Caitlin had video chatted each other very seldom, and this was not a regular occurrence. The second pair I worked with was Beth and Margaret. Beth is 81 years old and diagnosed with mild stage vascular dementia. Beth presented herself as quite high functioning and a great conversationalist. At first glance, one would not have known she had a dementia diagnosis. When I first met her, I confused her for one of the staff members. Beth was the fashionista of the group. She took pride in wearing beautiful clothes and jewelry. She was very active during the day, but during the evening hours would become forgetful, agitated, and confused. Margaret was Beth's family caregiver and the youngest of her children as well. She resided in Massachusetts and would visit Beth in person about once every few months. Prior to this experience, they had never video chatted each other. And the last pair I worked with was Kathy and Janice. Kathy is 87 years old and diagnosed with moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. Kathy presented herself as very kind, soft-spoken, and enjoyed the company of others. You could often find Kathy reminiscing about previous life experiences and enjoyed sharing her story with residents, visitors, and staff members. At times, Kathy would become disoriented and confused largely about where she was living. Janice was Kathy's family caregiver and the youngest of her children. She resided close by to Kathy about an hour away and would often visit her in person. Similarly, prior to this experience, they had also never video chatted each other. So some themes that I found in the interviews with the residents were they all enjoyed participating in the video chat session. They didn't report any negative experiences, and they also believed that their family caregivers enjoyed the video chat experience as well. Further, they reported missing their family caregivers and missing seeing their children in person. So this is a quote from one of the residents. We usually have mother-daughter conversations, but this experience went beyond that because I was able to see her. This was constructive, not destructive. I miss that this experience is over and that we have to stop the conversations. And seeing my daughter, I would rather video chat her and see her face on the screen than not to see or talk to her at all. So some themes that were noted from the family caregivers interviews were they all agreed that video chatting was an activity they wanted to do more often with their relative. They also reported that some assistance from either nursing staff or volunteers would be needed to help set up with the video chat sessions. Um, as an example, one of the family caregivers said that she wasn't really sure if her relative really grasped the new technology and would be able to participate on her own. The family caregivers also were more aware of how their resident or their relative was doing in the long-term care setting. So they had a good understanding of what their well-being was like throughout the day and the care that was provided to them by nursing staff. And lastly, it seemed as if the family caregivers who resided
resided farther away and could not visit their relatives in person reported more positive experiences about video chatting compared to the family caregiver who resided closer to her relative and could see her in person. So specifically, Janice, the one that lived closer, said that she felt like she could provide more comfort to her mother when she was distressed or having a rough day during their in-person meetings versus through video chat on the tablet. She also reported that at times when her mother would be deteriorate or become distressed, that it was hard for her to see that and she struggled with that difficulty, again, because she thought she could provide more comfort to her in their in-person sessions. Whereas the other family caregivers reported more comfort, felt more relieved, and less anxious about their relatives being in a long-term care setting with that consistent contact through video chat. So this is a quote from one of the family caregivers. It was great and comforting to see her and that she was doing well. I have a peace of mind knowing that mom was all right and that I was able to check in with her. I love seeing my dad and keeping in touch with him. He perks up whenever we video chatted and always looked happy when he saw me. Talking on the phone is not as meaningful for him. I feel bad that I live so far away and can't always see him in person. So video chat is the next best thing. So in regards to Robert and Kathy, staff were unsure as to whether they noticed any observable changes in them as a result of the video chat experience. They said that their Alzheimer's disease was progressing and worsening, and they weren't sure how much of the experience they remembered. Despite this, they all agreed that they thought that this experience was beneficial for them and that they enjoyed it in the moment. Staff noticed observable changes in fact and also agreed that she benefited and enjoyed the video chat experience. So these are some quotes from the staff. I believe the evening of each video chat session, Kathy was in a fairly good mood and I think this was an enjoyable experience for her. I believe Robert benefited from the video chat sessions in the moment and while they were happening. I noticed a big change in Beth. She would be excited about talking to her daughter on the tablet and would ask staff when you were coming so she could be there ahead of time. She recognized you and your project and that was wonderful to see. She seemed to enjoy this whole experience. Some themes that I noted from my observations of the video chat sessions were as the video chat sessions progressed, the residents became more accustomed to using the tablet. So initially, residents would physically move the tablet in a location where their relatives couldn't see them anymore or would talk in a direction that was opposite from the microphone causing difficulties with hearing. But again, over time, they were able to appropriately use the tablet as they became more familiar with it. Residents also seemed to remember the video chat experience and made an association that I helped set up the sessions. So over time, residents would come up to me and ask if it was time to talk to their relative or if it was time to see their relative. Residents and family caregivers took turns editing the video chat conversations and were able to do so when they thought it was necessary. So there was equal involvement on both parties with this. And lastly, it seems as if experience with video chat or no experience with video chat influenced the nature of the sessions themselves. So specifically, Robert and Caitlin, who had very seldom video chatted each other prior to this, were able to keep the conversation between themselves and only include me when technical difficulties occurred. Whereas the other two pairs, who had never video chatted each other prior to this, struggled to keep me out of the conversation and to keep the conversation between themselves. So there, and several times I had to clarify my role as an observer in the study and redirect them. So there's some practical implications. Long-term care facilities may use video chat as an activity available in their programming. And this can be especially helpful to the residents who don't have consistent contact with family members. They may find engaging in this activity meaningful, beneficial, and therapeutic. Video chat may also be helpful in addressing residents' concerns of boredom, loneliness, and improving quality of life. And lastly, 
video chat may encourage more family caregiver involvement and stronger communication with nursing staff. And this could be helpful for the family caregivers who cannot visit in person and wish to become more involved with their relative's care. So I truly enjoy being actively involved in this project and was very grateful to be a part of each pair's video chat experience. I'd like to leave you all with a fitting quote that I think truly sums up the essence of this project. Technology is best when it brings people together. Thank you.
So that's my hope. Um, <laughs> Um, because especially with the research showing that there's been an increased use of using psychotropic medication and physical restraints to manage some of these symptoms, the behavioral and psychological symptoms that we're seeing, I think that there's other ways that could be less harmful that we could utilize to supplement with their treatment and um, not only just assisted living facilities but nursing homes as well. So um, I'm hopeful that this would be one way of doing that, just kind of like a, a non-pharmaceutical way of doing that. As a follow-up, have you thought of possibly partnering with any technology companies that might want to go ahead and not necessarily, let's say, a reduced cost or partner with you to bring these benefits to these institutions and care to So I have never thought of that, but my family actually brought that up. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's a really good idea. So yeah, that's something that I definitely would like to look into in the future and kind of just partnering up and seeing know how that that whole dynamic would work. And then I just have a question just to clarify. Great study, love it. Thank you. Um, so did you provide the tablets when you went in or did the assisted living facility have tablets already? So um, since I was funded by the Broughton, I was able to purchase tablets um, to bring with me and for the residents to use. Um, I know that in both the long-term care facilities I was in, they had laptops and computers with cameras on them. So um, it's definitely an option to use video chat with their with. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, I just was wondering, in the instance where there is um, significant cognitive decline. Do you feel that some of these things, being that this is kind of a novel experience for these individuals, do you foresee that that might be any kind of obstacle in the way for them kind of understanding or feeling confused as to how they're interacting with their family member across the screen if they've never been exposed to that prior to their diagnosis? So, specifically um, with Kathy, one of the participants, she first thought that she was seeing a picture of her daughter. And over time, we kind of processed that and kind of clarified, you know, this is, you can see her, she's moving, like she's, you can talk to her. So we had to kind of coach her through that process in the beginning. Um, so that is definitely a potential obstacle, is, you know, that initial confusion of, you know, who is, is this my relative, or is this a picture of them, or, you know, what is this? type of thing, but again, I found that over time, they were able to adjust afterwards, so. From the management point of view, um, I know that one of the biggest barriers to doing new things in facilities is the time spent researching what is needed, and I'm wondering whether you um, were able or are planning to provide them information on the most cost-effective way to do that, which items to purchase, which software to use, and um, you know, I want to run out and get my mother-in-law a tablet. What is the cheapest way to do that? Do I have to buy the Apple product, or is there some cheap thing? So I actually, after um, the intervention was, or the study was over, I contacted the family caregivers and um, explained to them specifically what tablet I used, um, what, like we use Skype, for example, as the application. Um, explain how they would be able to download it, it's free, things like that. And I also relate that information to the um, long-term care settings as well. Talk to the directors about kind of the process that I went through to get all of that. Thank you so much.